Welcome back to another episode of Four Down Territory. I'm your host, Luke Easterling, alongside Doug Farrar. As always, Doug, week six of the NFL season is in the books now, uh, and we had a barn burner uh, that we were all looking forward to, a uh, game of the year candidate, uh, and it lived up to its uh, its billing, right? We had uh, 24-20 Buffalo Bills over the Kansas City Chiefs in Kansas City Arrowhead Stadium. Uh, we had the lead changing hands several times. We had uh, Teron Johnson with the game-winning interception, jumping that that shallow route and picking off Patrick Mahomes to seal the victory for the Bills. Um, just an incredible opportunity for a comeback there, just like we saw in the divisional round of the playoffs last year. Mahomes didn't get that because of the interception, uh, and the Bills get the last laugh on this one. But uh, now with the Bills at 5-1, and one, Chiefs are 4-2. and two. Are either of these teams better than the Philadelphia Eagles right now, who, again, are still the only undefeated team in this league uh, after their, their win over the Cowboys on Sunday? Yeah, Luke, 24 to 20. You didn't think we'd be hammering the under on that one, did nope, you? Nope, not at all. I was laughing about it at, at, at halftime at at, uh, at where we were, but things got good there in the second half. Yeah, we're talking about Mahomes and uh, Josh Allen. The stars of that game in the first half were Leslie Frazier and Steve Spagnuolo because <laughs> the defenses were dialing some stuff up. Um, sadly, the schedule, guys, did not favor us with regular season games between the Eagles and the Bills or the Chiefs. Worked that out, NFL. Not like anyone knew the Eagles would be undefeated. Um, so we may have to wait until the Super Bowl to find that out, which could, you know, very well happen. Uh, the Eagles are just as good as the Bills and Chiefs to me. They just win differently. With the Bills and Chiefs, it's about shot plays and quarterbacks who make no sense, along with underrated defenses. With the Eagles, it's body blows. It, pff, Rocky Balboa comes from Philly. There you go. Uh, the occasional explosive and a defense that just throws all kinds of fundamentally sound stuff at you. That, that secondary is, we don't talk about that enough. Hint, hint, there's an article coming. Uh, the Eagles may drain the gas out of your car as opposed to blowing it up, but that doesn't make them any less impressive, especially, and this has really stood out to me in the last couple of weeks, getting into some Jalen Hurts tape, how much he's progressed as a quarterback this season. He's not, you know, running when his first read isn't open. He's calmly going through his progressions. He's really matured as a quarterback. And when you consider all the draft capital the Eagles have in 2023, they don't have to spend on a quarterback they are in high cotton. So it's not just this year. It's, you know, what Howie Roseman and Nick Sirianni and, and his staff have done, it's it's pretty impressive. And I think they're, you know, because you can be undefeated and be average. Like the Vikings, I think, are 5-1, and one, and I'm like, I, they don't look like a 5-1 right. team to me. The Eagles look just fine as a 6-0 and squad. Yeah, and, and I think they really answered this question, the Eagles did, with the way they responded in-game Sunday night against the Cowboys, right? Because they got out to that huge lead. And then the Cowboys started chipping away there in the second half, got it back to a reasonable game. And then that's where you find out a lot about how a team is built, right? You find out a lot about the identity of your team when those moments come and the Eagles put them away, right? They did big plays on defense, big plays on offense, scored points, pulled away and, and, and put their foot down at the end of that game to, to make sure they stayed undefeated. The way they responded to that kind of in-game adversity and having to hang on to that lead and build it up again, I think tells you everything you need to know about how, where this team sits among the rest of the league. Uh, you know, they had the, the Lane Johnson injury that they had to deal with, um, all that momentum that, that Dallas had started to build up, and they were able to overcome that. So, like you said, they beat opponents with kind of a frustrating recipe, right, where it's just those body blows over and over and over again. It's not necessarily big chunk plays, but they can do those when they're when they're there. But, you know, they may have their shortcomings, but they've, they've still figured out a way to win every game, right? Something neither of the other teams that we just mentioned, the Bills and the Chiefs, have, have been able to do. They've got a couple losses on their record. So they're all in that kind of same conversation or echelon right now, but it really until they lose, the, the Eagles are in a class of their own. Yeah, I think that last touchdown drive, it was like 463 plays, and it took three games and, you know, 9,000 yards or something like that. I mean, it was I mean, almost as long as Astros Mariners the other night. Sorry to bring up a sore subject there in Seattle, but uh, yep, that was a tough one. It's estimated that Dak Prescott will be able to return the, to the field in Dallas next Sunday against the Detroit Lions. If that's the case, Dak gets two kind of get right, get well games against the Lions and the Bears before the Cowboys go into a bye week. Adding a healthy Dak Prescott to what that defense is doing in Dallas right now does that put the Cowboys in that same elite tier as the Bills, the Chiefs, and the Eagles right now? I think it does. And I wrote about the Cowboys defense this week, and it's just – it's uh, – and, well, 
The Cowboys ran into the worst possible scenario for their defensive fronts in Philly's offensive line because they're so disciplined, they're so technique sound. Even when they have backups, as long as you have, you know, Landon Dickerson, Jason Kelsey, um, obviously Lane Johnson, who with Trent Williams out for the year, that guy's the best offensive tackle in football, period, end of story. Um, but when Johnson left with a concussion, all of a sudden Micah Parsons was eating as he does. And the offense came back from a 20 to nothing first half deficit to make the game 2017 close where the Eagles were on the 13 play 93 yard touchdown drive. So it didn't exaggerate too much in the fourth quarter that sealed the game away. The Cowboys were able to do all this with Cooper rush, throwing up helium balls and giving the Eagles three really bad interceptions. You had Prescott's physical ability and predilection for covering up defenses. I mean, he, he reads the defense as well as any quarterback in the league. I don't think there's a lot of separation between the Cowboys and any other really, you know, top level team. Yeah, you know, I think it's it's possible that they could be on that level, and and I see flashes of it, but really, it's it's going to come down to the offensive line for me. You know, they've got to be able to protect Dak Prescott, keep him healthy once he gets back, and they've also got to keep opening holes in that for the ground game. Tony Pollard and Ezekiel Elliott have proven to be a really great tandem in the backfield. There, Dak has plenty of playmakers in the passing game. He's got Michael Gallup now at full strength. The defense is obviously one of the, the most talented groups in the league. On paper, this team has everything necessary to challenge those other three teams we mentioned, but they've really got to hold up in the offensive trenches for me to be able to believe in them. I think one of the things that impressed me about the Cowboys and the Eagles game last night is they were opening holes against Philly's five-man fronts, even when Jordan, Jordan Davis was on the field. And that's not something a lot of teams can do. So I get it. I know Tyler Smith at left tackle, the rookie, who they thought was going to be a guard. He's been up and down, but I think he's been more more ready for that role than I thought. And you kind of extrapolate that forward and say, well, if he develops, then they've got, you know, I, I think they're fine. We're already on the back end of uh, October here, which means we're not far away from the trade deadline in the NFL, which is coming quickly on November 1st. After Matt Rule was fired last week in Carolina, Rumors, it didn't take long, right? The, the rumors are swirling already about pretty much every talented player on that Panthers roster. Brian Burns, the pass rusher, Derek Brown, the defensive tackle, DJ Moore, the wide receiver, and obviously running back Christian McCaffrey, their names kind of being on that trade market, obviously of assuming there's some sort of fire sale going on in Carolina. It doesn't feel like it's going to be quite that bad, but obviously there's going to be some movement, and, and McCaffrey seems like a, a popular name. If you look around the rest of the league, though, opening the, the spectrum up to really any available player that might be on the market. What's one trade that you would love to see go down before the deadline? Yeah, apparently it worked for Robbie Anderson, who's now, I guess, in Arizona after his little tantrums. <laughs> Can't win with him. Can't coach with him. Can't do it. Uh, sorry, little Mike. So we'll I was only, you were only missing the uh, taking the pads off and throwing stuff into the stands and then jumping jacks in the end zone. That's what I was waiting for. I know, right? Uh, I know that McCaffrey's injury – I'm going to stick with Carolina because I know that McCaffrey's injury history and his contract was an unfavorable duo, but I cannot stop thinking about what the Bills' offense would look like with Christian McCaffrey on the roster. <laughs> he is stuck in stack box purgatory with Carolina's horrible passing game. I don't know if you saw P.J. Walker's passing chart. I did. Wow. I did. It was not fun. It was – it was bad. And he's not able to do everything he can do as a receiver, obviously. I would love for Bill's general manager, Brandon Bean, to decide that McCaffrey was worth the remainder of the four-year, $64 million contract extension. Never sign running backs to contracts like that. <sighs> Whatever mid-round picks he'd have to give up to take on the deal and then see what kind of heck could be unleashed with McCaffrey in an offense that already ranks first in football outsiders DVOA metrics. The Bills with a top-tier running back and overall no no slight on Devin Singletary. But a healthy Christian McCaffrey is in a different league. You put him in that offense the way it's designed, and imagine what that looks like. Yeah, I really think that's the obvious choice. I, I think we'd all love to see that happen unless you're a Carolina Panthers fan. Um, but if we're speaking of running backs, and this might seem a little bit off the radar here, but can please someone just saved Dearness Johnson from what the depth chart that he's buried under in Cleveland, right? He's got Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt ahead of him. Hasn't had much of a chance to prove what he can do, but when he has a couple of years, I think it was last season, late in the season, um, there was a game where both of those guys were hurt and he got a chance to, to and he rushed for over a hundred yards, had a touchdown in that game. Um, He's still young. He's obviously got not you know plenty of tread on the tires because he hasn't had many carries while being in Cleveland. I'm obviously biased because I'm a USF alum and I saw him play down here in Tampa and, and and saw what he can do at the college level. But 
I would, I would really love to see him get an opportunity to be a featured back with a bigger role in an NFL offense instead of being buried behind those two veteran guys that are obviously not going anywhere right now. Yeah, I, I, you should refer to him as his full name, 2021 Secret stu- Superstar. I will make sure that I do not miss that title from now on. Now to finish up, Doug, let's go to Foxborough, where the Patriots are sitting pretty at 3-3 three and three after that 1-3 and three start. They've got consecutive wins over the Lions and the Browns. Not impressive opponents, but a win's a win, right? In those two victories, the Pats started fourth-round rookie Bailey Zappi from Western Kentucky as Mac Jones continues to recover from an ankle injury. Now against the Browns, the Pats win 38-15. to Zappi completes 24 of 34 for 309, two touchdowns, no interceptions, and a passer rating of 118.4. So moreover, he had several deep shots, including some against the Blitz that he was able to connect with. Do we have a quarterback controversy brewing in in New England, even though the the Patriots just spent a first-round pick on Mac Jones last season? Yeah, well, I mean, you run draft wire, so you know this. You you watch Zappi in college, too. We know from his college tape that he was a smart quarterback who got the ball out quickly in favorable offensive looks. He also threw 17 touchdowns of 20 or more air yards, and a lot of those were schemed open, but still. Um, I think he's portrayed as a sort of Chase Daniel, Chad Pennington, noodle arm guy. That's not what I see. I'm not saying it's a Josh Allen plus arm, but, you know, could he turn to Kirk Cousins? I don't know. Um, And there was one throw against the Browns, one of his five of 20 or more air yards, by the way, that caught my attention. Tyquan Thornton ran a deep crosser against Cleveland's cover three. Zappi, he had a he had an open read first, but he wanted to wait for it to come open. In doing so, he had to evade pressure, move up and to his left in the pocket, and hit Thornton on a crossbody throw past linebacker Jacob Phillips, who had dropped into coverage to match the route. Zappi hit the throw with timing, velocity, and location, and it reminded me of some of the crossbody throws Geno Smith has made this season. I don't know what's in Bill Belichick's head after Zappi's two starts, but my thought after that throw and other throws studying his tape this morning, Monday morning, was I don't know if Mac Jones makes all this happen. I think Mac is more limited as far as, you know, throwing on the move. He's an average deep ball. I think Zappi is a better deep ball thrower than Mac Jones is. Um, Maybe the Patriots can open up a little more of the playbook with Zappi than they can with Jones. And if that continues, there is that story a couple decades ago about the low-drafted quarterback who took over for the injured starter. Some I don't remember his name, but if you Google it, you can probably find out who that is. Yeah, yeah, and down here in Tampa, I think we've heard of that guy. Um, he's, he's he's done a few things down here the last few years. Um, I mean, he's yelling at his offensive line for one. Don't, don't get me started. Oh man, I mean, you at least have to consider it if you're Belichick, right? I mean, the the best teams are the ones who don't get hung up on sunk cost. Um, whether it's you know Kirk Cousins taking over for an injured RG three, whether it's Matt Flynn who was signed in Seattle and then they spend a third round pick on Russell Wilson and realize, oh, he's the guy. Um, and they went with those guys and rolled with those guys and were able to win some games. So I can't, I can't imagine a team. And and again, a coach like Bill Belichick, who obviously just will do whatever it takes to win. I don't see it, him taking it personally or, or, or doing whatever to, to make sure Mac Jones is in the game because they spent a first round pick on him last year. He wants to win games. And if Bailey Zappi gives him a better chance to win games. And like you said, open up the playbook a little more because of what he can do. And some of those areas where Mac Jones might not be as good. I feel like you have to consider that, right? I mean, especially once you start winning games as a quarterback, the locker room starts to rally around that guy, right? Because they ins- he inspires belief in that team that he's going to get them where they need to go. And if he continues to push this offense to new heights, I mean, I think old McCorkle might be a, a backup for a little while if, if this continues, right? He was a first-round pick a year ago, but but it's it's hard to imagine that not happening if Zappi keeps winning games. Wouldn't it be so Belichick to get a couple of first round picks for a from a team for Mac Jones? <laughs> You're just like, oh God, he did it again. Um, yeah, I you know, obviously he, you know, Bleds Drew Bledsoe had the huge contract and Belichick will always say the better and coaches always say that. Most coaches don't actually believe it. Belichick believes that he's ruthless in that regard. So yeah, we'll see what happens. But um, you know, McCorkle might be you know, his ears might be burning a little bit. And I read the transcripts after the Browns game, and it seems like the veterans, and I, I was in the locker room for Russell Wilson's rookie season, mm. and I saw how immediately the veterans, guys like Lawyer Malloy, you know, just, just guys you wouldn't expect to go all in on a rookie quarterback right. or all in on Wilson, like when training camp started, they're already there. And I'm not saying it's this same way, but – 
the way the veterans are talking about Zappy has me thinking there's at least some, I don't know about controversy because we like to, you know, bring those things right. up. The Hello Cowboys. <laughs> um, I don't know about controversy, but I think there is an element of, hey, this guy's better than we thought he would be. Well, we're excited for another week of NFL action next week, Doug. Hopefully it'll be just as uh, as wild as the one we just had. Hopefully we get a game somewhere along the lines of the Bills and Chiefs and what they did for us this week. Uh, but either way, I'm sure we'll have plenty of storylines to break down in next week's show. We thank you, the fans, for joining us every week. Once again, for Doug Farrar, I'm Luke Easterling, and we'll see you next time.